Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Connell Mallory. I'm a senior lecturer here in the law school and the director of the, Q, uh, the uh, Human Rights Centre at uh, Queen's Belfast. I want, I want to welcome you all, uh, a very warm welcome as well to the law school today, particularly for anybody who hasn't been here in a while and you're, you're returning, as well as for those who, who come quite regularly. Um, uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Niall Murphy with us today and for Niall to welcome back. Niall's Queen's alumni, class of 1998. Um, interesting year here then. Um, Niall's a solicitor working in Belfast. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about trying to tackle and challenge uh, right-wing ideology from the trenches, from uh, from the trenches in the courts, from uh, um, uh, from practice. Um, his practice addresses challenges across um, uh, the the, the right-wing ideological network, um, whether it's uh, defending uh, and working alongside investigative journalists or whether it's um, freedom of speech issues or trying to get access to courts um, for no reasons that need to be explained. Niall's going to talk to us today in particular about legacy. Um, and uh, with 24 hours ago, the House of Lords passing the um, Northern Ireland um, uh, Legacy Troubles and Reconciliation Bill. And uh, unless Bertie Ahern has it right, then King Charles isn't going to grant royal assent. It's likely that that's going to become law within the next couple of weeks. So Niall's going to talk to us uh, for about 35 minutes about that, leaving plenty of time for, for, for questioning um, afterwards. So um, Niall, very welcome. Uh very much a pleasure to Colin for the kind introduction and also uh, from the school here for the invitation. I, I did leave here uh, in 1998 and uh, have often valued uh, the education that I, that I benefited from whilst here. I didn't realise in June when I accepted the kind invitation to address you all today that the fates would decide that today would be the day after one of the most utterly legally and morally repugnant um, pieces of legislation passed by a UK Parliament would become law. Certainly, in my view, it's one of the most offensive acts of Parliament in the history of Anglo-Irish relations. Uh, I regret to observe that we are in a moment of sincere distress with regards to any notion that we might reside in a society whereby human rights are protected, promoted and cherished. I regret to observe that we do not re reside in such a society. Yesterday's legislation has the audacity to include the word reconciliation in its title. Uh, this law is cruel, callous and immoral. I'm confident that in the fullness of time it will be declared unlawful, hopefully by our domestic courts, most certainly by the European Court of Human Rights. The title of today's presentation references explicitly uh, the rise of a right-wing ideology. And my intention is to provide an overview as to the role of the practitioner in confronting that. Brexit Britain under the Tories has witnessed an erosion of the authority of the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary and the legal profession. Lord Dyson, in his valedictory speech upon his retirement on the 26th of July 2016, a mere five weeks after the referendum result on the 23rd of June, spoke of his mixed Lithuanian and Bulgarian heritage, and specifically the six months spent by his mother in Bergen-Belsen in 1944. He expressed a fear that British tolerance was at risk. He said, I am fearful that it is being put under strain by the xenophobia and dangerous forces of hate that have been unleashed in some quarters. He concluded, perhaps mischievously, that as a fallback position, he might be entitled to a Bulgarian passport. In my remarks, I want to trace the policies which threaten political stability here, indeed ethical morality, as well as state compliance with international legal obligations and how lawyers here are central to the debate, both in practice litigate, litigating the issues, but also as figures for derision by the state. I do not seek to recite the decades of legalised lawlessness conducted in this jurisdiction, be that the policy of internment, the special treatment meted out to the hooded men, Indeed, one of the first casualties of the recent conflict was the rule of law itself and the right to a fair trial, the right to be to a fair trial heard by own peers. Lord Devlin observed that trial by jury is more than an instrument of justice and more than one wheel of the Constitution. It is the lamp that shows that freedom lives, that being a reference to the candles which were lit in London in the windows of houses following the acquittal of seven bishops in 1688. I do, do not seek to review the Prevention of Terrorism Act, temporary provisions 
1974, which benefited from a mere 17 hours of debate in the House of Commons before its draconian powers were approved. What I do want to address is our slow, or perhaps not so slow, lurch to the right, and the fact that we are now shackled to a Brexit Britain replete with sewage-infused water, lowered food standards, crumbling schools and hospitals and prisons, nurses and doctors on strike for safe staffing levels, under a government who describe human beings as illegal, send them to Rwanda or moor them in prison ships whilst painting over Mickey Mouse and Baloo from the Jungle Book from the walls of asylum seeker reception centres. Those murals were painted over because the immigration minister thought that they sent the wrong message as they were too welcoming. The same government which, whilst attempting to legislate its way out of the obvious problems which Brexit caused with regards to its pre-existing obligations under international law, the withdrawal agreement, had the audacity through the expressed intention by the Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis, to advise the Commons, yes, this does break international law in a very specific and limited way. Mr Lewis's remarkable admission was met with a warning from former Prime Minister Theresa May, who cautioned immediately that it could damage trust in the UK over future trade deals with other states. The Permanent Secretary to the Government Legal Department, Sir Jonathan Jones, the government's most senior lawyer, resigned from the government in light of the bill, believing that the plans went too far in breaching the government's obligations under international law. Lord Falconer himself, a former Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, asked the government two days later in the House of Lords whether the government were in fact committed to the rule of law. And when you think about that, that's an exceptional question to be posed uh, in a parliament. Lord Falconer warned that the acceptance that the government are deliberately breaking international law would be thrown in the UK's face for years. As he said, expect dictators to justify murderous breaches of international law by, by relying on the Lewis mantra, specific and limited. In a celebrated speech in 2009, the late Lord Bingham listed the liberties that the European Convention protects, the right not to be tortured or enslaved, the right to liberty and security of the person, the right to marry, the right to a fair trial, freedom of thought, conscience and religion, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association. Which of these rights, he asked, would we wish to discard? Are any of them trivial, superfluous, unnecessary? Are any of them un-British? It has been observed that such a step would set the clock back 50 years, and one could only consider the wolfish delight with which Russia, Turkey, Hungary, and other authoritarian states would greet the repeal of the Human Rights Act. They will say, if Britain no longer enforces the European Convention, why should they? I want to address the concept of cause lawyering. Uh, I'm intend to do so by illustrating some means by which uh, legal practitioners here have represented victims and survivors of the conflict in an attempt to gain access to justice through engagement in our courts, and then to assess what can only be described as routine attacks on, on lawyers as a matter of government policy. Before approaching either topic in preparation, I decided to reread and reflect on Kieran McAvoy of this fine university's seminal article, what did the lawyers do during the war, neutrality, conflict, and the culture of quietism? About what constitutes a cause lawyer? The cause in question, as he makes clear, is not a narrow political one, but rather a commitment to the protection of human rights and upholding the rule of law. Certainly that commitment and several related traits are discernible in my practice, and I'm, I'm delighted to see my partners, Kevin Winters and Joe McVeigh here, and the current practice of many lawyers practicing presently, particularly those acting for those who seek access to justice for crimes endured by them during the conflict. To recap, uh, Kieran observes some of the characteristics of cause lawyering include lawyers who work in the system to shape and challenge laws, lawyering as a public profession where the contribution to society is more than the acquisition, aggregation, and deployment of technical skills, and lawyers must face head on their broader social, political, or moral responsibilities in a society emerging from conflict. Generally, ours is a society of widespread economic and political disenfranchisement. These are aspects of our jurisdiction that politicians in Westminster are loath to be reminded of. In Brussels, 
uh, and uh, Luxembourg. We may appear at the margins geographically, economically and politically. But in Strasbourg, the North has remained solidly, solidly at the forefront of much jurisprudential thinking regarding the responsibilities of individual member states and individual human rights. Lawyers here, in addition to being under attack during the conflict, were at the forefront in using the ECHR on behalf of our clients and fearless in taking cases against the British government to the European Court in Strasbourg, resulting in landmark judgments, including McCann and others, Jordan versus the UK, Kelly and others versus the UK, McCurr and others, Shanahan, McShane and Finucan in 2003. The terror threat, as we know from experience, uh, when this jurisdiction was used as a testing ground for repressive laws and policies and practices as part of the state's counterinsurgency strategy, uh, exampled techniques and approaches which we all know were then replicated in the war on terror, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the block courts, internment and interrogation. In the years since 9-11, a new security agenda has ushered in a plethora of draconian measures which surely speak to an ever-increased importance of maintaining safeguards to protect the citizen as a bulwark against the omnipotence of the state. There is a particularly hard edge to policing, be it through stop and search, surveillance under RIPA, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, the use of informers, covert human intelligence sources, the tension between policing and national security, and therefore the security services, public interest immunity applications, closed material procedures, uh, of which a lecture on its own uh, could be presented, the return of the supergrass, and pre-charged detention limits being extended. The state strives to protect on the grounds of national security, but its arguments to do so do not often make good law. For example, the very public intention of Dominic Raab to repeal the Human Rights Act would not only have had political consequences for the constitutional arrangements under the Good Friday Agreement and the subsequent agreements, but would also remove as a legislative mainstay in the toolbox of those charged with representing the interests of those brought before the courts in these cloaked circumstances. And just by way of example, uh, in a closed material procedure, um, sensitive material is considered by the court and the legal practitioner is not even physically allowed in the court. The court is locked. There is a lock put on the, the door of the court uh, and the lawyer is not allowed to be present. The draconian measures currently at the availability of the state to defend itself in addition to the public debate around the repeal of the Human Rights Act, therefore create a difficult context within which a lawyer must work. The challenge of the day, today in fact, more than any other day, is assisting victims and survivors of our recent conflict to access justice and to obtain truth recovery. Reflecting again on Professor McAvoy's concept of cause lawyering, I again recognize the practice adopted in my own firm and others and the ways in which lawyers challenge prevailing political, social, moral, or legal power. He describes it as a form of moral activism where committed lawyers do more than simply deploy their technical skills on behalf of their client. Through pro bono work, strategic litigation, styles of argumentation, and public mobilization beyond the courtroom. I stress again, the cause being referred to here is not an ideological or party political one, Rather, the cause which is being litigated presently is actually ecumenical. It has no ideology. It is solely motivated by promoting the human rights of all victims and their right to the truth. So to understand what is at stake with the new legislation, I want to provide some brief illustrative examples of the work that our practice has undertaken in recent years, providing advice, assistance and representation in the various legal architectures which discharge the state's obligations under Article 2 of the Convention. I want to address civil litigation, um, judicial review, the Office of the Police Ombudsman, and the importance of inquests. So by way of example of civil litigation, our practice has the privilege to represent Catherine Johnson, whose father, Constable Harry Beckett, and a colleague were shot dead by the IRA in Belfast City Centre in 1990. She has instructed our practice to pursue civil litigation against the Chief Constable, invoking her civil rights as underpinned by the Convention, when it became apparent to her that the weapon that was used to murder her father had been under the safe custody and control of the RUC before being returned to the IRA, who then used the weapon to murder the two policemen. This grotesque fact was reported in a BBC documentary broadcast in 2015 
when the nefarious activities of a shadowy unit of the RUC Special Branch was exposed. Work, uh, the Weapons and Explosives Research Centre, were a division of Special Branch who retained primacy over exhibits, the most crucial issue for the integrity of a criminal investigation and justice and trial process, prior to those key exhibits being submitted for forensic testing at the forensic lab. The revelations estimated by the police ombudsman to be a factor in close to 60 murders suggest that the special branch provided false information to investigators with regards to ballistic histories to suit an overarching intelligence agenda. Baroness Nulo alone was definitive on her remarks on the issue when, wherein she stated, terrorism was not defeated by organisations like work. The question is to what extent was terrorism enabled? With regards to the Office of the Police Ombudsman and the importance of access to the court via judicial review, I would like to reflect upon uh, our, our, our cases on behalf of those victims and survivors of the Lachan Island atrocity. Six men were murdered in June 1994, including Barney Green, aged 87, the oldest victim uh, of our recent conflict in a rural county down pub whilst they watched Ireland play Italy uh, in the World Cup in New York. It was the most successful sports event in Irish history to that date. Gunmen burst in and raked the bar with 29 bullets from a VZ-58 automatic rifle, which our clients next of kin suspect was imported to Ireland by the British Ministry of Defence. Despite complaining to the police ombudsman about their concerns in 2004, no report was published until 2011, and on the topic of arms importation, that report glibly stated the police ombudsman has no legislative remit to investigate complaints made about alleged military agents. That report did not include the words special or branch either. The family successfully challenged the report by way of judicial review, uh, setting the investigative obligations on the state under Article 2 and had same quashed by the High Court in December 2013. A new report was published by the new police ombudsman on the 9th of June 2016, which provided a definitive account on the failure of policing in the 1990s, which rather than cauterizing the conflict, exacerbated and prolonged it. Dr. McGuire found that collusion was an unambiguous feature of the atrocity, a conclusion which would have been denied to the families had they not challenged the previous report by way of judicial review. Indeed, the Logan Island case has seen public mobilization beyond the courtroom, uh, uh, a factor referred to by Professor McAvoy. In June 2012, for example, Ireland had actually qualified for the European Championships in Poland. I don't think either team in Ireland are going to qualify for the current European Championships. Um, and remarkably, on the actual anniversary of the atrocity, uh, they were drawn to play Italy again. The families were overwhelmed emotionally at this happenstance and instructed me to write to the FAI to inquire could the Irish team wear black armbands during the fixture, uh, an application which was acceded to and provided the opportunity for a communal act of remembrance on an international scale. A documentary film made by Oscar-winning director Alec Gibney on the atrocity and the family's fight for truth recovery uh, was broadcast and nominated for both EFTA and Emmy documentaries and also won the Royal Television Society Award. And I'll, I'll, I'll turn back to that documentary later in my presentation. With regards to the importance of inquests, um, we represent uh, many families bereaved as a result of the Birmingham pub bombings in 1974, which killed 21 people, including the loved ones of the five families we represent. It speaks volumes that these families had to come to lawyers in Belfast, and due to restraints of the present legal aid system, we have acted pro bono, another of Professor McAvoy's indicators for cause lawyering, for our expertise and assistance in their pursuit to obtain truth, justice and accountability. I should say that Kevin Winters had personal carriage off that file. The family of the 21 victims were bereft of access to justice and did not receive the support, nor had the benefit of any investigation, save by their own volition, for 42 years following the wrongful conviction of the Birmingham Six. And quite rightly, they, they posed to us rhetorically that the Birmingham pub bombings were more uh, remembered for the Birmingham Six uh, than what they should, felt should have been the Birmingham 21. Um, but there had never been an inquest. An application was made by ourselves to the senior coroner, Louise Hunt, sitting in Solihull, to have the inquests reconvened um, as the original inquest had never been completed. She decided on the 1st of June 2016 to reopen those inquests. 
A retired judge, His Honour Peter Thornton, was appointed to preside, and the inquest commenced in February 19, concluding on the 5th of April 19. On behalf of our clients in next to kin, we objected to a narrow scope, uh, which had been adopted and indeed successfully judicially reviewed that scope. However, the coroner appealed successfully that High Court finding to the Court of Appeal, and as a result, serious concerns persist that the police and the authorities knew as early as 1975 who put the bombs in the pubs and it wasn't the Birmingham Six. We continue to represent our clients and have brought these grave concerns to the attention of the Home Office. We await a consultation with the Home Secretary in coming weeks, which will be the end of a three-year process of engagement to allow her to make a decision on the request of the families to hold a human rights complaint inquiry, public inquiry, into the bombings, independent of the stained investigations of the West Midlands Police, which would be capable to examine the surrounding circumstances of the bombings, including foreknowledge and why the investigation got it so atrociously wrong. Our client Julie Hamilton is as passionate, as able and as effective an advocate for families, indeed all families, in her opposition uh, to the government's legacy bill. The bill, which was concluded its legislative path yesterday, was first published on the 14th of July 2021 and will end all European Convention compliant investigations, instead introducing uh, a broad sweeping amnesty, more, more expansive. Uh, it has been observed by academics at this university than that introduced by General Pinochet in Chile. The legislation will end civil proceedings, inquests, will close the historic director of the police ombudsman, and instead establishes an independent commission for reconciliation and information recovery, which we respectfully observe has far more limited powers and can only conduct desktop reviews into legacy cases. UN experts have expressed grave concerns regarding the now law, which they assessed as having provided for blanket impunity and placing the UK in flagrant violation of its international obligations. Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, Dunja Mijatovic, with whom we had a private consultation, raised concerns that the command paper proposals would lead to impunity and conflicted with ob obligations under the Convention. The bill has united in a unique fashion political parties from across all spectrums, both here and in America, in condemning its cruelty. The House of Parliament's own Joint Committee on Human Rights published a report <laughs> on the 26th of October, 22, the summary of which notes, and I quote, we have serious doubts that this bill as drafted is compatible with articles two and three of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to life and the prohibition of torture and inhumane and degrading treatment or punishment respectively, as well as articles six and 13, the rights to a fair trial and the right to an effective remedy. The former Secretary of State made a statement under section 19.1 that in his view, the bill is compatible with convention rights we have serious view, doubts that his view is correct. So in an expression of legislative thuggery, my description, this bill has become law and families are now left to pick up the pieces, condemned to another cycle of litigation against a government hell-bent on affording an immunity to its own soldiers. In addition to the aforementioned callous attacks on victims and survivors, there has been an unnerving pattern of ministerial attacks on lawyers, which leaves me in no doubt that there is a formal policy on attacking lawyers. Indeed, just last week, the immigration minister, uh, who has a personal disdain for Mickey Mouse, announced the Professional Enablers Task Force, which would increase enforcement against lawyers and legal representatives who help migrants to abuse the immigration system to a sentence of up to life imprisonment. Life imprisonment. On Monday of this week, Baroness Helena Kennedy KC, one of Britain's most renowned criminal lawyers and a Labour peer, has compared government attacks on the profession to the tactics used by authoritarian regimes and stated that ministers were deliberately creating scapegoats. She said, I run the Institute of Human Rights for the International Bar Association. One of the things I'm seeing all the time is our lawyers under attack, under authoritarian regimes. The first thing that authoritarians do is they go after judges to make decisions they don't like. They go after journalists. They go after any of their critics, whether it's Alexei Navalny in Russia, or if it's in Turkey or in Iran. 
They go after lawyers and they end up jailing lawyers and undermining co public confidence in lawyers. And so we should recognise that as one part of the story how law is undermined and respect for law is undermined, it's about denying accountability. Uh, Justices, the, the, the organisation um, uh, who released the report that was published on, on Monday of this week said that there was a palpable trend in the UK over the past five years of increasingly derogatory marks, remarks such as lefty lawyer and activist lawyer. It highlights examples such as the reaction to the government's defeat in the two Brexit cases and ministers' comments on lawyers challenging immigration policy. The report observes they criticise lawyers who are legal aid lawyers for actually acting for those who couldn't afford litigation. We don't want the courts to be the place in which only the wealthy can enjoy justice. What we are seeing in the insults and the abuses of our judiciary that unelected judges are making decisions. We want unelected judges at one stage removed to be able to make judgment about what is right and what is the appropriate use of power and who is abusing it and who are the abusers of the rules in our society. The report refers to concerns raised by some in the Supreme Court uh, that the Supreme Court has fallen into step with the government in recent years and says that even if it is mere coincidence, it might give the perception that the UK's highest court has been influenced by ministerial pressure. Among a host of recommendations to protect the rule of law, the report says the government must safeguard judicial independence and the legal profession and reject the use of inflammatory language against them. Baroness Kennedy said, many of the people who are lawyers on the conservative benches are as concerned as people like me. So this is not confined to lefty lawyers, inverted commas. This is something that is shared by decent lawyers, lawyers who actually believe in the rule of law. Then Prime Minister Theresa May's Tory party conference speech on October 16 pledged not to allow left-wing human rights lawyers to harangue and harass the bravest of the brave, set the tone for the attacks on lawyers here. Her then Defence Minister Michael Fallon said, our legal system has been abused to level false charges against our troops on an industrial scale. It has caused significant distress to people who risk their lives to protect us. It has cost the taxpayer millions and there's a real risk that will stop our armed forces doing their job. In December 2016, some weeks later, several articles in The Sun and Daily Mail use similar language to attack solicitors working on legacy cases. The Sun has the highest circulation of any UK daily newspaper, and the Daily Mail the second largest. Why are our soldiers facing a new witch hunt? That's the Daily Mail's front page. Up to a 1,000 retired soldiers in their 60s and 70s face a police witch hunt some 40 years after they battled terrorism in Northern Ireland. The news comes only after two months, uh, comes only after two months after Theresa May pledged that Britain's forces would be protected from such witch hunts. The veterans could face charges, trials, even jail. The Sun ran similar articles that same week, December 8th and 10th. Headlines included tech chase lawyers' agony for a thousand squatties, firms profit from heroes. Lawyers here have been excoriated by the government for taking these cases. But surely the large scale damages, millions of pounds paid by the Ministry of Defence, prove that our successful clients did not invent the facts compelling these settlements. The concluding remarks of the report by Washington DC, NGO Human Rights First, uh, in their report, A Troubling Turn, the Vilification of Human Rights Lawyers in Northern Ireland, accurately assessed the temperature, which has not abated. They concluded, Renewed hostility towards human rights lawyers, those representing the families of people allegedly killed by the British military, recalls the troubles on Augur's new danger. History tells us that rhetorical attacks against lawyers by the press and public officials can lead to violence, which in turn inhibits the pursuit of justice and undermines the rule of law. The hostility towards human rights lawyers strikes at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement, which embedded respect for human rights into the politics of Northern Ireland. It's especially alarming given the UK's bro broader backsliding on its human rights commitments. In addition to attacks on lawyers, there has also been a concerted and sinister pattern of attacks on the independence of journalists and the right to free speech. This was addressed very explicitly and in detail by our divisional court in 2020 in the matter of an application by Fine Point Films, Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey for judicial review in the matter of an application by PSNI and Durham Constabulary for search warrants. Keys, custodiate 
Ipsos Custodes was written by Javanel a couple of thousand years ago, and it means who will guard the guards themselves. The idea was also explored by Plato, who associated it with the need to speak truth to power. It's a centuries-old question that when we give authority and power to people to order our society, we need to ask who watches over them. In a modern democracy, where official checks and balances often mean the system regulating itself, the value of a robust free press is never more important. Churchill himself said, a free press is the unsleeping guardian of every other right that free men prize. It's the most dangerous foe of tyranny. It was therefore with a deep sense of hurt that the Lock and Island families woke to the news on Friday the 31st of August 2018 that Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey had had their homes raided at 7am, their office raided at 7am, and that the two men had been arrested. Both Trevor and Barry were producer and lead uh, journalist and were integral to the making of the documentary uh, No Stone Unturned, to which I referred to earlier. The film documents the collusion and cover-up by the RUC in the murders at Lachan Island. A police ombudsman investigation, as I have described, found the shocking depths of state collusion in mass murder, that the police had indeed elevated the eminence of intelligence to a higher importance than the rights of murder victims. The families had hoped that the film would inspire and motivate arrests, that the murderers who had ruined their lives in June 1994, as the film demonstrated, there was ample evidence to arrest and prosecute. The families are proud of the film and the sensitive yet hard-hitting manner in which it documents the totality of their experience. The families consider themselves privileged that the facts of their case are crystallized so professionally and comprehensibly so as to be the exemplar by which the state's policy of collusion can be instructed to the uninitiated observer. The film names the suspects arrested and ultimately protected by police. The families know that the film strikes a raw nerve in the security establishment and are proud that they benefit at least from this empowerment after years of being without a voice. The film has provided them with a loud and unimpeachable voice. The arrests of Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey was nothing more or less than a crude attack on the personal lives and work of two journalists who exposed an uncomfortable truth. They were not thieves, as the police alleged. They had not handled stolen goods. They were motivated to excavate and publish the unvarnished truth, which had been denied to the families of those murdered in Lockin Island for decades. They exposed the facts in a case that had been buried for so long, and try as they might, the case proves that the police could not arrest the truth. Journalists must be free to investigate and expose issues of public concern. Few subjects could be of more significant public concern than the mass shooting of civilians and the alleged collusion of police in assisting those responsible to evade justice. That the only investigative actions arising from the facts exposed in that film were the arrests of those who exposed the facts rather than those suspected of committing the atrocity, is a matter of public importance, a fact recognised by the then Lord Chief Justice in his judgment, in paragraph 55. For the reasons given, we have concluded that the conduct of this hearing, the application for their search warrants, fell woefully short of the standard required to ensure that the hearing was fair. That was sufficient for our de decision to quash the warrant. We wish to make it clear, however, that on the basis of the material that has been provided to us, we see no overriding requirement in the public interest which could have justified an interference with the protection of journalistic sources in this case. The Fine Point Films judgment has been described as a vociferous, full-throated endorsement of the central value of journalists, journalistic source protection in a democracy on a strict application of Article 10 convention rights to the powers of police search and seizure in UK law. The judgment set firm boundaries on the scope of criminal investigations and issues new robust guidance to warrant authorising courts on the necessity, value and importance of journalists' rights in our democracies. I'm conscious we're coming up to 35 minutes, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, in conclusion, lawyers are more than paid technicians. In addition to being professionally and technically proficient, excellent perhaps, we have moral and social responsibilities, in particular to help those most vulnerable, and those who have suffered so egregiously. 
We have broader responsibilities to stand up for the rule of law and the protection of human rights. Regardless of the political mood being stirred by the Conservative government, I can reassure you that myself, my colleagues and other activist human rights lawyers will not be found wanting in living up to those responsibilities. Thank you. Many thanks to Niall, such, a, such an engaging um, presentation, folks. We, we have plenty of time here for questions, okay? Um, I, I'll, I'll take questions from the room. If you're comfortable, let us know who you are. Um, if you forget it, don't worry about it, you're grand, okay? Um, so we, we'll we'll take some questions. What I, I'm going to do, just to give you a minute, just if anyone wants to think about one, is I'll abuse my position and, and begin to tackle Niall on a couple of things. Now, super trying to look at this as an academic, the idea of populism informing law and and leading to I think you you referred to it as legislative thuggery in the um in in the the legacy uh, the legacy bill soon to be the legacy act. W when does this start? Okay, the UK's had a, a a dubious relationship with its international human rights obligations. I would argue probably well for 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 decades, but but certainly since the war on terror. We had a decade, really, of of quite uh, quite severe anti-terrorism measures um, facing international terrorists, and then the political uh, background begins to change. Then, with the coalition government and into the conservatives, what's the tipping point? When when do we when do we become uh, a society which is threatened by? these appeals to populism which results in the legislation that we see whether it's the northern ireland act whether it's the overseas operations act you know the the the, the sister legislation to this whether it's the police act which is greatly restricted how um people can protest covert human intelligence sources act you know we we there's a you know there, there's a a mixed bag here of of acts when does it start for you um just with okay, dealing with it very specifically, you can almost trace it uh, chronologically by date and by case. Um, and if I take your question in the prism of the, the bill that was enacted yesterday, um, you, you, I, I deliberately referred to Theresa May's remarks at the Conservative Party conference in 2016. But if you review the uh, cases that were being considered in court, before then, it was really the sudden understanding in the military constituency of the Conservative Party uh, that uh, the the impunity, the, the de facto of impunity that state actors had benefited from forever uh, was now coming to a close. Um, and that was through the various um, cases that were uh, progressing and meandering through our court system. And they they may they may have resolved themselves in 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 different means. The first, of course, would have been the Bloody Sunday inquiry, um, which would have compelled soldiers to give evidence at the inquiry. That that would have happened in the early part of the century, two thousand to say two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Um, just lawyers, you know, we're all we all evolve, we all observe and react and. Uh, the, the 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 six cases uh, McCurr, uh, Kelly, Fanukin, and others, Shanahan, uh, they effectively uh, and collectively um, brought with it a new definition of uh, the investigative duty under Article Two, and in response to the impact of those six cases, the British government was obliged to discharge what were found failings. Um, by the court, and um, the European Court has an office which supervises the execution of judgments, and uh, that office. So, so a Euro Strasbourg judgment doesn't just sit on the shelf and gather dust. There are peri periodic reviews, wherein the office for the supervision of the execution of judgments requires submissions as to, okay, what are you doing, member state, and in discharge of those found feelings, um, the British government itself proposed our coronial system, the event, the fact, the access to an inquest as uh, a remedy to its found failing under Article 2. Uh, it proposed the setting up of the HCT, the Historical Inquiries Team, on the, on the PSNI, and also uh, invoked the police ombudsman as a mechanism 
to discharge the found feeling. So when it was being put to the pen of its collar, uh, the British government, not families, not victims, not the NGO sector, not academics, the government itself proposed inquests, the police ombudsman, uh, and in fact, in, in later representations, referenced civil litigation. So when, when lawyers assess, understand, and react to those emerging, evolving legal facts, which really sort of came in around 2005, 2006. Uh, we, you, you receive instructions. It's, it's very simple, you know, human transaction. A, 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 a next of kin comes into the office and explains the circumstances of their loss. And you advise specific to those facts, which legal arena might be the appropriate venue to exhaust the opportunity for access to justice on, on truth recovery, which in, in most cases is the overwhelming ambition. You know, some families are comforted by, you know, understanding the, the final moments of their loved one's, you know, life. You know, did somebody hold their hand? Was it an act of contrition said? And those are facts that can only be released uh, when, when, the, when the cases are interrogated. And some cases came in, just to be clearly frank, uh, crimes had were, were apparent from the papers. Murders were very, very apparent. Over, overwhelmingly on behalf of state actors because non-state actors, you know, went to court, went to jail. So the unresolved murder cases that were so clear overwhelmingly had a, a, a load on unprosecuted, obvious uh, cases. And in, in, in some cases, you would have assessed your facts and said, right, well, I think that is best dealt with by a complaint to the police ombudsman. Or I think this could be an application to the attorney general for a, a new inquest, or that's murder. You know, that's that's a that's an application to the the public prosecution service. Um, and on some cases, so you know, we don't decide. You know, that we, lawyers, families, lawyers have been vilified and you know set up for ridicule. But I don't decide a prosecution. That's the director of public prosecution decides that. I don't decide whether to convene a new inquest. That's the Attorney General that decides that. I don't make the decisions in an inquest. That's the judge that does that. All we do is represent the family's perspective in those various arenas. And with you know more clients coming forward, understanding their newfound legal rights, because they didn't have any, pre Kelly, McCurr and others, understanding that they did have uh, newly defined rights under Article 2, there was families coming forward that had always had that yearning for truth recovery, for an understanding of what happened to their loved one. And if that re resulted in the opportunity of a prosecution, whether it resulted in the opportunity of fresh facts, whether it resulted in the opportunity to cross-examine, uh, you know, state actors that, that were involved in the, the death of their loved one, well, any family wants to exhaust their legal rights. And what this law does is closes all that down. You know, it, it, it's the most stark, egregious legal event in, in, in my life. And I, I can recall graduating from here in 1998, which was the, the year of the Human Rights Act, which became law in 2000, which was the year I qualified as a solicitor. And, you know, there was a huge, big uh, conference in the waterfront. I think Bryce maybe spoke at it. And the Human Rights Act was described at that time as the legal big bang, you know, everything changes. This law is another legal big bang, and it's for the wrong reasons. You know, what on what legal planet can the defendant to proceedings decide to insulate itself from liability by saying, no, you can't sue me for the facts that you know? So one of our cases, we we have we're working diligently. In the office, preparing challenges and pre-action protocol letters have issued today. My phone turned off. I'm hoping that there's more issued by five o'clock. Um, proceedings will be lodged tomorrow. But one of the cases that we're 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 challenging that right is uh, on behalf of a, a man called Christopher Wallace, whose father was murdered in the Devonish Arms in 1982. Uh, Aidan Wallace, and he didn't know, comprehend, or understand the extent or event of collusion in the murder of his father uh, until the police ombudsman's report into the Sean Graham's uh, bookmaker was published. 
um, in February 2022, last year. Uh, and as he was, for the first time, understanding the concept that uh, the police had protected his father's murderer from prosecution because uh, the murderer was an informer, uh, he, he wanted to consider his, his legal options. Um, we were strongly advising him that he, he should sue the chief constable. And by the time we, we were able to perfect instructions, give him advice, him to decide what he wanted to do, consult with his family, the government said, no, you, you can't sue us anymore because we, we don't want to be sued anymore. That's a, an abuse of power. But that's a society that we're now living in. Uh, the government knows what it did. So there's a big whiteboard, I have no doubt, in Whitehall, because they did it. We don't know the extent of their knowledge. They do, because they did it. And they know what's coming down the line in terms of truth recovery. And that's why this law is being brought in, to cauterize the publication of truth, because the publication of truth itself perfects history. Because history, as it was previously understood, we can now definitively say was wrong. And when history is being corrected through judicially endorsed inquest narratives, police ombudsman reports that I don't write, but ombudsman writes them, a judge writes the inquest uh, narratives, or through disclosure and civil litigation, well, then it becomes about the reputation of the state. And the state knows what it did. It understands now what the full discharge of Article 2 means with regards to an official narrative. And I think that that's why we're seeing uh, just a complete legal shutdown um, through this new legislation. Are there any questions from the floor, folks? The family of Steve Baker, the back consciousness leader, has been murdered by the state. Went to court, saying there was a right of access to justice and freedom of life. He was given rights in South Africa. And the constitutional court of South Africa, which included people like Alvin Dax and Arthur Chaskill. Thanks, Declan. They applied the constitutional principle of Ubuntu and said uh, that that trumps the right of access to justice. I'm thinking also of what happened 100 years ago in Ireland after the War of Independence and then the Civil War in 1923 and 24. Acts of Parliament were passed that are probably even more extreme than the Legacy Act, which is just gone through Westminster. It drew a line under everything. No civil uh, civil cases, no criminal prosecutions. All, all actors were, were entitled to, to amnesty, including the Black and Tans, including uh, um, various factions who had fought against each other in the Civil War. No prosecutions. And that was just two or three years after, or even less after the Civil War. Now, why in principle was it okay for South Africa and, and Ireland to do that? But it's not okay for the UK government or, the, or Northern Ireland to do it. I'm not talking about this particular bill 
which has gone through, which is flawed in many ways. But in principle, why is it possible in other jurisdictions, but not here? And I mean, if the European Convention on Human Rights had applied in South Africa, what, what happened there wouldn't have been lawful, but yet it was what society wanted. Thanks. A very good question, but <clears throat> I think I can respond that in two concepts. One, the primacy of the rule of law. You know, the UK is a signatory to the convention, whether it likes it or not. <clears throat> in fact, its lawyers wrote the European convention. Uh, John Maxwell Fife was a British Conservative MP. I don't need to lecture Bryce Dixon on this, but just for others in the room, um, he he was a member of the British Army. He was part of the uh, Liberation Task Force at one of the concentration camps and seen with his own two eyes what the Nazis had done and was moved, along with others, obviously. As a, a lawyer, he was a KC, um, was moved to legislate surely as legislative animals as a as a as a conservative MP and as a as a senior barrister. He he felt that his moral, social, legal responsibility was to create legislation that such inhumanity as he had seen could never be undertaken by any state against any person or 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 people. And that's where the European Convention on Human Rights comes from. So it's written by British male white conservatives. It's not a socialist left-wing doctrine. It doesn't provide for a right to welfare, a right to housing. It's fundamental rights. The state will not kill you. The state will not torture you. The state will not put you on trial without uh, having a fair trial. So they're, they're very fundamental, basic rights written in its first draft by British conservatives. Uh, and the UK are an author and ongoing signatory to it. So whether it likes it or not, the British government is obliged to adhere to its international legal responsibilities. So that sets it aside from a rule of law primacy perspective. Uh, that that's, takes us out of the South African argument uh, and I, 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 I would have grave con disagreement as to uh, how Ireland uh, dealt with its civil war uh, legacy because it infected politics uh, for almost 100 years and I don't think should be held up as a modicum for uh, a post-conflict society. But aside from the primacy of the rule of law, the difference in this specific regard is it, it it strikes to the heart of the concept of democracy. You know, this is a, a piece of legislation that is serving only to placate the interests of the military wing of the British Conservative Party. It's to resolve a conflict within a political party who don't stand here, have no mandate here, don't have any elective representatives here. There is absolute unified opposition to this legislation by every single elected representative on this island, not just the North, on this island. So there is no mandate whatsoever for this legislation in respect of the people against whom it will affect. So, you know, aside from the legal and moral arguments about the legislation, it represents an abuse of democracy. Yet again, there is another piece of legislation being imposed upon us by London against our express democratic will. The second time in six years that this has been done, they have wreaked havoc with Brexit, which was against the express mandate of this jurisdiction. And now they're imposing their own militaristic uh, rights or interests against the rights of victims and survivors here. So I, I do think that uh, this legislation has its own unique perspective um, and from a primacy, a primacy of rule of law and a fundamental point of democracy, uh, this legislation is a threat to both. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jeff, you want to 
Hi, uh, Sarah Lachlan. I'm a law graduate who works in politics. Um, another hat that you wear is, I suppose, a civic leader on conversations around Ireland's future. Um, and I'm wondering what you think civic and political leaders on the island of Ireland can learn from how the British government has approached legacy when approaching potential constitutional change on the island. Well, I, I, I would reflect back to my my last remarks there that this legislation in itself represents an imposition of a militaristic uh, viewpoint and in itself is an abuse of democracy. So the British government can no longer hold itself out as uh, an independent arbiter, either on constitutional preference in this jurisdiction. And we've seen that during the week that uh, the Secretary of State objected to Leo Varadkar's noble declaration that he considered that we're on a pathway to a referendum, which is in itself an expression of democracy. You know, what is there to fear from the expression of democracy if we call ourselves Democrats? Um, and you had that dichotomy whereby perspective for the maintenance of the union is responsible, perspective for reunification of the two traditions on this island is irresponsible. And that's not right and should not be allowed to go unchallenged. Um, we could do a whole separate seminar on constitutional futures. Um, but again, fundamentally, it's a matter of democracy. And what, what has anybody to fear from presenting its arguments researching its positions, uh, presenting those to the electorate and having the electorate express its its view. It's, it's the most fundamental means by which we regulate ourselves as a society. And uh, I, th I think I think that day is coming sooner rather than later. Now, can I jump in with another question? Sure. Just, just so... The big bangs happen, okay? The legacy bill is going to be the legacy act. Now, there, there's a number of things that can happen going forward, okay? Um, we have Hillary Benz and the, the Labour government, a Labour government would scrap it. And we, we could be, you know, what, 15 months away from a Labour government, couldn't we? Um, we've got the European Court of Human Rights as a possible avenue with a case, another Ireland versus UK case, okay? We've got your litigation and the litigation from, from the families and, the, and, and there, will be, there will be heaps of this coming down the line. What, what do you see as the big landmark next? What, what's the what's what's either causing you sleepless nights, or what do you see as being the the, the next challenge to deal with to to, to begin to to deal with the, the the legacy act as it will be? Um, what, what what's on the calendar for you with that? Well, I, th I think you've you've addressed it yourself. Uh, and 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 in the first instance, families will lodge applications for judicial review. You know there are there are several species of challenge which can be taken. Um, a family who will have benefited from a reasonable expectation that there would be an inquest into the death of their loved one uh, has now lost that if it's not concluded by uh, May twenty twenty four. So uh, there there are a, a number of of families and applicants that could take that challenge. A family who were waiting upon the publication of a police ombudsman's report in discharge of their Article 2 rights uh, and might not now get that. They have a challenge, a family who had a reasonable expectation that the public prosecution service would commence a prosecution against any individual. Um, that will now not happen. That family has a judicial review. Um, a family who, and I recited the, the Wallace example, a family who... Uh, had an intention or had uh, an appreciation of facts that informed them that they had a right to take civil litigation. That is now being lost. That's a judicial review. Not to get too technical, there's a pre-1990, post-1990 Janovich type point. So there, for all of those cases, there are a pre and post. So that, that there's a twofold of, of cases that could be taken. Um, and, and all of those cases will be taken, let me assure you. But the weight that that places upon, you know, the most vulnerable people in our society, 
is just irresponsible. It's obscene. The families again are having to litigate the state to comply with its own international legal obligations. Um, any challenge will be vociferously defended, I'm sure, by the state and the High Court. Whichever party loses in the High Court will appeal to the Court of Appeal. Whichever party in the Court of Appeal loses will appeal to the Supreme Court. And that uh, legal chronology could take as long as two to three years. Um, I My preference would be for an interstate challenge uh, because they will have access to Strasbourg quicker directly than, than any family will, will have the opportunity to. And I you know, re reference Ireland's future. I had a meeting with Virat Kaur on Thursday past and we, we raised it very clearly. And silent enough in the meeting, but from public commentary the day before, um, by himself as Taoiseach, by Simon Coveney, I was left with the confidence that that application will be taken. I, I believe there will be an Ireland versus UK. Um, technically, he has to await the royal assent being passed and then receive formal advice from his Attorney General, but I think the case is so overwhelmingly strong um, that that application will be taken. Um, so in terms of landmarks, families and victims and survivors will move as expeditiously along that path. But I also believe that in Ireland versus the UK, Mark II will, will move quicker on, on that path. Thanks very much, Niall. I wanted to ask about the new legacy commission and how do you see the work of that commission sitting aside, sitting alongside those challenges that you're talking about in relation to the Legacy Act? Um, well, the 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 organisation has had its titular head appointed, um, the former Lord Chief Justice, uh, Sir Declan Morgan, but there requires thereafter to be uh, a heavy recruitment. Um, it's a, it's, it will be a well-resourced, financially resourced organisation, but there is significant recruitment that requires to be um, undertaken. Uh, I don't know how long that will take before it is in a position to formally open for business, as it were. So I think that there is uh, room for a challenge to commence immediately, um, and that will happen. Um, I also think that it's likely that uh, that the ICRIR will either be a, def a, a party to the proceedings or will seek to assert its own notice in, in any such proceedings. And it will have an opportunity to uh, tell the High Court how it believes it can discharge its obligations under Article 2. Uh, I wait with interest the detail upon that. I personally don't think that that organisation can um, purely from an independence perspective, because it's ultimately beholden to a Secretary of State. So the legislature, which cannot uh, supersede a judiciary or a, a police ombudsman, does have autonomy over what documentation might be released to an ICRIR. So on that point alone, I don't feel it has the opportunity to discharge Article 2 but again, that's my perspective, um, and that will that will fall to be decided in a challenge. And the the Declan Morgan himself has said uh, that he will not preside over uh, that organisation if it is found that it cannot discharge Article Two. So I think, you know, practically speaking, the recruitment that requires to happen, and there there is also an independence feature of Article Two as to what type of investigator can be recruited. For example, it is received law um, that Article 2 independence means that a former member of the RUC could not be an investigator in a police ombudsman or a, a, a coronial investigator. Therefore, one would expect that that should also extend to the ICRIR. But all of that needs to be facted out um, and there will be you know, publications in that regard. So it's very much in its infancy. And as... Connell quite, quite rightly uh, observes my, my colleague Kevin Winters publicly challenged the new shadow Secretary of State last week 
to publicly confirm that he, if becoming government, which is I think Labour will come in at the next government, and that could be as soon as 2024, that they would repeal the act in any event. So this hiatus that we're in might only last for as long as it takes the Irish government to get to Strasbourg or for as long as it takes for the Tories to collapse, which they're a fragile entity anyway. Um, the, the, a Labour government could come out us sooner than we think. Um, hi, I'm LLM human rights law student. Um, you talked a lot about the European Court of Human Rights, but after every single kind of controversial legislation the Tories produce, they keep on talking about potentially withdrawing for it. Do you see that as a genuine challenge that might be coming up, or do you think it's just something they're saying to try and kind of keep their little ecosystem working? Ecosystems are good way of putting it. I, th I genuinely think that they genuinely would love to withdraw from uh, the convention, but that they know that they can't. And, you know, well, you know, it's the same entity that harbored uh, exit from the EU when uh, all the you know, sensible voices in the room were saying you can't, but they did. Um, I think Dominic Robb's last formal run at it, which failed, w was the last feasible attempt to withdraw from it. I don't think that, you know, the UK will re repeal the convention or withdraw itself as a signatory. Um, but I do believe that the same political wing that brought us yesterday's bill would sincerely love to uh, withdraw its uh, secretary from the convention. Now, uh, right stuff, just before I left the house, it was being discussed today, again, on the BBC, and it was raised that it is the only reason that there was a Hildebrand disaster inquiry because the families were were forced to go to to go to Europe because the British courts tried to block those families from getting truth. So it's still out there, and and I think there's I'm not saying there's a possibility it could happen, but the fact that it's still being discussed in Britain is a concern as well um, about uh, what's happening overall. But uh, the other thing, just in terms of the the nuts and bolts of the Legacy Commission. Um, does the commission only work if families work with it? Um, if families refuse to work with it, does it fall or can it go on its own? Um, that, that, that's, that's actually a very good practical question. I think that the commission would, if the commission was found to be capable of discharging the state's Article 2 obligations, then it would remain open for as long as it took to manage the complaints lodged with it on that. And I don't think this will happen because I, I do think that the, the legislation will be struck down eventually or repealed, but that um, insofar as it remained open, that that would be the only sort of show in town and that families might be left in a position whereby if they didn't engage with the ICRIR, that uh, there would be no venue for engagement or for the opportunity for truth recovery. Um, but that would be a very personal decision to be taken by families. Um, and it, it's not dissimilar to the HET. You know, many families understood that the HET was not fit for purpose, but engaged in any event and exhausted the opportunity for truth recovery insofar as the HCT provided. Um, and that might be uh, a useful working analogy as to how people might engage going forward. But we're in the white heat of the day after, the morning after the night before. So there's a lot of uh, petals to settle um, before people know where they stand. Super. Well, 
I think we've kept now for quite a while, and it sounds like he's going to have a busy couple of days coming up ahead. Um, and so with that, I think one final time, we're going to we're going to thank Niall for such a such a, a an inspirational speech. Thank you.